Hello, my name is Benjamin Hart. I'm an American attorney and the managing director of Integrity Legal here in Bangkok, Thailand. So this is kind of one of those videos where kind of more of an opinion piece, just, just generally me almost kind of thinking out loud. Uh, the reason for the article, I was reading a recent article from the Washington Post, that's WashingtonPost.com. The article is titled, Appeals Court Upholds Texas Law Regulating Social Media Moderation. Now, I would argue this may be probably the seminal opinion, however it goes, regarding free speech in the United States, probably for the first quarter cent for the first quarter of this century. I think when they ultimately make this decision, one way or the other, and I think ultimately the Supreme Court's probably going to have to hear this, although it's not a foregone conclusion, it never is. They can they can sort of deny cert and say that you know we're not going to hear it, but the I think they probably will, because there's a lot to unwrap here. So let me get into this article. I'm going to quote a fair bit of this, but I urge those who are really interested in this, go read it all. Go read, excuse me. Go read it all, because there's a lot going on here. Quoting, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit on Friday upheld a controversial Texas social media law that bars companies from removing posts based on a person's political ideology overturning a lower court's decision to block the law and likely setting up a Supreme Court showdown over the future of online speech. Quoting further, the decision diverges from precedent and recent rulings from the 11th Circuit and lower courts, and tech industry groups are likely to appeal. So just as an aside, and just something to think about, this is very important when they say it, it diverges from precedent and recent rulings from the 11th Circuit. When you get two different circuit courts of appeal, so for those who are unaware, folks that aren't from the United States, if you're interested, there are what are called circuit courts of appeal, which are over and above the district courts in the federal system. So they'll oftentimes cover a grouping of states, usually like a half dozen, although depending on population sizes, it, it, it does kind of vary. So, but like, yeah, you'll usually see these, there'll be a grouping of states that one circuit covers. You can end up with situations, there was a situation involving uh, widows associated with U.S. immigration benefits years back that was one of these, where for a long while, because the Supreme Court didn't get around to it, there were two differing circuit court opinions. So in two different parts of the United States, in that immigration case, you could have sort of a different scenario operating with respect to the practical implications of the law, because you know, these two different circuits had two different opinions on the same issue, basically. That's important here, I think, from, from the standpoint of it going to the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court generally likes to go ahead and hear cases where the circuit courts are in conflict, uh, because they kind of want to smooth it out, usually. It's not always the case. Sometimes those things will, will remain a while. In the case of the widow issues with immigration, it did remain for quite a while, as I recall, a number of years, but in court time, that's really not all that long. Quoting further, in the opinion, Oldham wrote that while the first, Oldham being one of the judges that was in the circuit, uh, that made the circuit court opinion, Oldham wrote that while the First Amendment guarantees every person's right to free speech, it doesn't guarantee corporations the right to, quote, muzzle speech, unquote. And it, this is really the crux of this. It, it's interesting, this is me talking, it's interesting this whole case and this whole issue because in most cases where you deal with free speech, you're seeing, you're seeing one side saying, hey, this public interest is more important than free speech. Obscenity law is a good example where they say, oh, that's, it's, it's antithetical to the, or, or it's, it's in opposition to the good morals of the community, the contemporary community standards. They're saying basically, you know, we want to block certain amounts of speech because we feel like there's a public health and safety issue at play, essentially. That's what they're saying. In this case, that's not what's really happening. It's, it's very interesting because both sides are arguing the First Amendment. They're just arguing it from a different perspective. I'll get into this a little bit more. But again, in this, in this particular case, in this appeals court ruling from the Fifth Circuit, the judge writing the opinion wrote, 
I'm going to quote this again. While the First Amendment guarantees every person's right to free speech, it doesn't guarantee corporations the right to, quote, muzzle speech, unquote. Quoting further, the Texas law, he wrote, quote, does not chill speech. If anything, it chills censorship, unquote. And that's another kind of backwards way that this is kind of operating. Texas passed a law that banned social media, certain social media providers from quote unquote muzzling speech or from barring, you know, bar, it bars companies from removing posts. So it's barring companies from taking things down. It's saying you can't pull that down. It's not saying you have to say it. It's saying you're not, a, you're not allowed to, to, to remove it, basically. It's interesting. This is, this is where you're really seeing modernity hit the, the law in real time. And the law always looks backwards. The law always moves slowly. And this is something, you know, I mean, as a practical matter, we probably should have dealt with this years ago. But this is just the way it is. It, 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 it goes slow like this. Quoting further, an appeal of the decision would force the Supreme Court, where conservatives have a majority, to weigh in on the internet regulation, which has become an increasingly politicized issue since the 2016 election. Quote, if the Supreme Court doesn't weigh in, it's going to be increasingly difficult to operate a nationwide social media company because it could be navigating state rules that differ or even conflict, unquote, said Jeff Kosseff a cybersecurity law professor at the United States Naval Academy. Yeah, good point there. As I said earlier, you get in these situations where one circuit is saying one thing and another is saying another, and then you got a bunch of states running around that have promulgated their own legislation, which may differ you know, in minutia from one jurisdiction to the other. So interesting stuff going on here. Quoting further, earlier this year, the Supreme Court stopped the Texas law from taking effect in a five to four decision responding to an emergency request from the tech industry trade groups. Yeah, that will happen from time to time where there's something that's big or the court thinks it's a big enough issue that they'll say, yeah, we're just going to put an injunction on that until we make a final decision. Now, interestingly, you could argue that, that, that allowing that emergency decision, sort of allowing that injunction may have stifled speech in the meantime. Hard to say. Reasonable people may be able to disagree. You know, I think it's very odd to say the least but even perhaps more the word might more correct word might be concerning that the there is a group out there that is is not only trying but very much advocating the removal of content online just just blanket ability to remove content online now i'm not saying that there's not content you know especially like truly obscene content, you know, things like child pornography, things of this nature, that absolutely must be not just regulated, but, but removed. It shouldn't be out there. But that's a pretty high threshold. You know, I mean, we're talking, essentially this law has to do with whether or not people's stuff can be removed from social media platforms just because of their political leanings. And that is a very different issue. Again, political speech, a very different animal than even commercial speech or just even sort of almost what I'd call social speech, where you're just kind of talking off the cuff. Political speech is considered highly protected by virtually every Supreme Court that's ever, that's ever interpreted the U.S. Constitution. Quoting further, however, the judges did not explain the reasoning for their decision, which is common in such requests. Yeah, if anything, the judge's decision to essentially issue sort of a preemptive injunction would lead me to believe this is very likely to hit the Supreme Court's desk, and they're very likely to adjudicate it. How they adjudicate it remains to be seen, but they're clearly aware of it. They've issued an emergency ruling. I just don't see where they would do that in order to create a situation where really there's quite a bit of legal uncertainty out there. Quoting further, in their ruling, the Fifth Circuit judges agreed with Texas that social media companies are, and this is interesting, quote, common carriers, unquote, like phone companies that are subject to government regulations because they provide essential services. Now, again, uh, we're walking some fine lines here because, you know, the issue is, is your website your own 
property in the same sense that like your personal domicile, people don't have a right to freedom of speech in, your, in someone's private home. They can't, they can't run a protest through your house just because they want to. You know, that it's considered, you know, private property, you know, the U.S. constitutional guarantees on freedom of speech don't necessarily apply. But again, here, where these, these companies, and I think it's a good analogy, are looking a lot like phone companies used to look in like the 80s and 90s, where it's sort of, yeah, you are a private company, but you're also essentially a public utility. People need to use the internet in, modern, in the modern era, much the same way they needed to use the phone lines in 1990. You know, it's just something that, it's just a matter of course that you need to use that utility, quote unquote. Quoting further, conservatives have long made this argument, which has resonated with at least one Supreme Court justice, Clarence Thomas, who has written that there are parallels between social media companies and phone companies. And as I said, I kind of see the logic there. Quoting further, tech industry groups and legal experts warn that the Fifth Circuit's decision runs counter to First Amendment precedent and warned it could result in harmful posts staying on social media. And again, this is one of those where I understand the counter argument. A lot going on here. This is kind of dueling rights, if you will. You know, because the tech companies are saying, hey, you know, it's, it's our property. We created it. It's ours. If you want to be on it, you need to follow our rules. But at the same time, it's starting to look more and more, at least in my opinion, like these things are looking a lot like common carriers, less like, you know, just, oh, it's, you know, it's Ben's private, you know, it's Ben book, you know, and, and there's, and there's 18 people on Ben book as opposed to Facebook because nobody wants to be on Ben book. Well, on that one, that's not a common carrier. You know, so I can see the argument where, okay, that's my private property. If I, don't, if I want to block, you know, what people say or whatever on this carrier or on my platform, that's what I'm going to do, essentially. I, I understand the argument on, on that, but this is evolving rather rapidly. Just quoting further, because there is something to be said for the counter-argument here. I'm not, I don't know quite where I'm at on this just yet. What I do know, what I really like is free speech. That's what I really like. But trying to figure out the ins and outs of this in, in practice can be, can be a bit daunting. Quote, little, more, little could be more Orwellian than the government purporting to protect, free, to protect speech by dictating what businesses must say, end quote, said Matt Schurers, president of Com uh, Computer and Communication Industry Association. Quote, the Texas law compels private enterprises to distribute dangerous content ranging from foreign propaganda to terrorist incitement and places Americans at risk, end quote. Well, I think it got a little hyperbolic there at the end where, okay, yeah, some of that stuff might be subject to removal depending on the circumstances. But again, this, this Fifth Circuit Court ruling seems to be based on the notion of removing posts merely based on that person's perceived or real ideology. It's, it's not necessarily these higher level things of foreign propaganda or whatever, which, I, look, I can understand that they, they bleed together. It's not, it's not always a cut and dried issue, but this is really interesting. I'm going to try to keep up with what goes on with respect to this case. I'm really hoping the Supreme Court weighs in and kind of gives us a good, I, I hope they give us a really solid framework for dealing with this in the future, because I really have to say, especially the past couple of years, I found the, the chilling effects of speech online in multiple different fora, you know, to be really concerning. You know, I have seen things, I've seen people be blocked for saying things, in my opinion, were pretty innocuous. It wasn't, they weren't saying anything, you know, that, you know, that in, in the, context of the Espionage Act in the United States constituted a, quote, clear and present danger to the national security of the United States, which can be cited as one reason to perhaps restrict certain types of speech under certain circumstances that there is case law on that from the past. I, I didn't see a lot of that. What I saw was a lot of, oh, I don't agree with that opinion and I'm going to take that down. That, that seemed to me what I was, what I was seeing. So again, you know, I don't know how this is going to play out. It is rather interesting because it really is free speech 
being not redefined, but just reinterpreted in the modern context, because this isn't a situation where somebody's saying, hey, I have free speech, and somebody else is saying, hey, there's a policy interest here. No, it's sort of, hey, I have free speech, and somebody else says, so do I. What do we do with both of those parties? 